Okay, we thought we'd try something new. So this is called a thrust. It puts me closer to you. The better with to see you, my dear. It, um, <laughs> you know, new year, you try new things. How many of you think this is actually safer than me wearing skinny jeans and a tight t-shirt, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, what, that's TMI. Um, I was uh, uh, 13, I grew up in North Carolina. And, and it, North Carolina is a, it's a basketball uh, state, love basketball. And I, I played ball, and uh, back when I was seeing it, we're talking late 60s, early 70s, th there weren't a whole lot of shoe choices. And in fact, Converse made, they had 80% they had of the market, and they made something called a Converse All-Star. You heard of them? Affectionately known as what? Chucks, right, Chucks. Well, in 1971, they came out with a, uh, and I didn't get them until later, but they came out with suede chucks. And when I saw those, I thought, I have got to have those shoes. Because those shoes will change my entire life and basketball game. And so, man, they were suede. They were red suede. And, and they had blue suede. I wanted some red suede shoes. And so I uh, talked to my parents, and they said, no. They make, make canvas. Why do you need suede? They didn't realize it was going to change my life. And, and, and so I, I've worked a deal. I said, here's the deal. Um, I'll pay for, you, you pay for what a canvas shoes, and I'll pay for the rest. I saved money, man. And when I got those suede shoes, I thought, man, this is, this is awesome. Here it is. I'm ready. Uh, and it did not change my life. And it, and, it, and it did not help my basketball game at all because it didn't help me with, uh, it didn't help me with my defense or my ball handling. But, in fact, all it did was bleed all over my socks. Suede, when it, gets, when it gets wet, it just sweated red. It looked like my feet were bleeding. And so it was, it was something, though, that gave me a sense of hope. When I got those, it gave me a sense of hope that my basketball game was going to be better. I believe every year, New Year especially, people start off with a sense of hope or a desire. that Life is going to be better. They're looking for... For progress, And we're going to do a series this month called Accelerator, the process of progress. And we're going to be talking about some of the principles and, and some of the things that are, are really necessary, to, to, the things we need to do to get where we want to go. And I have a lot of, I have a lot of faith that if you maybe you felt like you haven't made progress ever, I believe this year could be different. That you have never, you know, had the success maybe in your Christian life or your family life. And you're thinking, ah, it, it doesn't work for me. I believe it can be different. And so stay with us. Because I, I really believe that I'm going to talk about some things that I haven't. This is a brand new series. And I haven't talked about these things before, but they will help you. And they'll make a difference in your life. Now, let me go back to the shoes for a second. When I, when I wanted those shoes, I was so excited when I had them because they were new. And there's something about new that gives you hope. Have you ever noticed that? How many of you have to admit that you were kind of excited about the new year because it's a new year? And I, I won't ask you how many of you made New Year's resolutions. I found some New Year's resolutions I thought were interesting. I don't say that they, these did not come from our staff, but I thought I'd just share some of them with you. One guy wrote, my New Year's resolution is to be more optimistic by keeping my cup half full with either rum, vodka, or whiskey. <laughs> this, here's, a, here's the great New Year. This New Year's, I resolve to be less awesome since that's really the only thing I do in excess. <laughs> that needs to come with a selfie, doesn't it? Okay, someone, someone had a New Year's wish for someone. May all your troubles last as long as your New Year's resolutions. And here's my very favorite. Dear God, my prayer for 2019 is a fat bank account and a thin body. Please don't mix it up like you did last year. <laughs> My 2019, by the way, losing weight is the number one New Year's resolution. My 2019 resolution is for everyone else to gain the 50 pounds I refuse to lose. And then here's the very optimistic one. There have been many times in 2018 when I've annoyed you, disturbed you, irritated you, and bugged the heck out of you. Today, I just want to let you know I plan to continue in 2019. <laughs> New Year's resolutions. And uh, 
there's something about new that's appealing to us. There's something about new, uh, new plans or, or new ideas or new amazing products. You know, they sell a lot of exercise equipment at the beginning of the year. And there's a huge market in used exercise equipment. Or let me, shall I say, rarely used exercise equipment. And, but, but the idea, again, is new. And then, of course, how many of you realize that with a, a new, uh, new relationships, you know, that, that the new romance, and, you know, someone has had, man, they got a new love in their life. And, and they come and they're just like, oh, they're so awesome. And they're just, they're great. And they don't have any faults. And they're just awesome. And everything is wonderful. And if you just, just look at them and smile and go, praise God, do not look at them and go, you just wait. You just wait. <laughs> but there's just something about new. And you know what it is about new? New inspires hope. Hope is a, is when we talk about Bible hope, hope is a confident, favorable expectation. You're expecting something good. And the reason that hope springs up new every year and every new relationship and every new goal or new idea or new piece of equipment is it gives us the promise that things can be better. And we need that. That's vital. That's vital to life. If you didn't feel like things could be better, chances are you wouldn't even be here today. Or maybe you came looking for hope. But we need hope in life. Uh, you heard me share about the, the study they did back in the 50s with rats. And they took two groups of rats. They put one, in, one group in a, in a vat of, of water, a tank, where they could not escape. And the rats swam and swam. And they swam just for a few minutes. And then because they couldn't get out, they just ducked their heads under and drowned. The other group of rats, they let them swim and swim and swim. And before they drowned, they pulled them out. They rescued them let them rest, dry off, and then they put them back in the water and they swam for hours, not minutes. Well, what was the difference? The difference was there was the hope of being rescued, the hope that things could be better. Now, if you're a believer, if you have a faith, and if you've made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, then you actually have an advantage over so many other people because your hope is not just in a new year or a new relationship or a new piece of equipment. You have a relationship with the God of hope. And the God of hope can give you a favorable expectation when nothing else looks good. And you can say, well, why do you have hope? You can say, Cause, man, because I, I know God's God. He's a God of hope. I want to show you a great scripture. I, I love this scripture. It's in Jeremiah 29. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You say, well, Alan, that wasn't written to me. That was written to the nation of Israel. Yeah. It was written to a backslidden Israel who lived in disobedience and was living in captivity. And even though they're living in captivity, even though things have not gone right, even though they turned their back on God, God says, you don't, I got plans for you. And they're good plans. They're not plans to harm you. They're plans to give you a future and a hope. Listen, if you want to abandon any idea this year, abandon the idea that you don't matter to God. Abandon the idea that you're not significant to him. Because if you ask him, he's like, oh yeah, I've got good plans for you. And they're not plans to hurt you. They're not plans to take you under. My plans for you are to give you a future and a hope. God's got good plans for you this year. You say, well, I don't know about, about plans. To, do, do, I, do I really want to plan? Oh, yes, you want to plan. You hear people say the devil's in the details? I really believe it's God who's in the details, and it's God who's in the plans. And if God's in the plans, plans are powerful. And God will give you a way where there is no way. Here's, here's a good word for 2019. God's got a plan. What are you going to do about this, Alan? I don't know. God's got a plan. What are you going to do about those needs in your life? I don't know, but God's got a plan. He is a master planner, and he can have a plan, and he can help you. Now, many of you know, I, I, Joy and I have three children, Matthew, Christina, and Michael. You don't hear a lot about Christina and Michael. You hear a lot about Matt. Matt was the oldest one. Matt did a lot of stupid stuff, and Christina and Michael watched Matt do stupid stuff, and they said, we're not going to do stupid stuff. So I don't have as many stories about, about Michael and Christina. But I, I do have a lot of stories about Matt and his creativity and his things. But I tell you what, it, it did pay off. Right now, in fact, he is with a team is in Guatemala. They're putting up five playgrounds uh, in Guatemala in rural areas. Thank you, church, for helping make that happen. So, 
His adventuresome spirit paid off, but his youngest, Michael was the youngest. Michael's nine years behind Matt. And Michael, when Michael came, Michael kept walking into walls and falling. And when he would fall, it wouldn't even break his fall. It just land on his face. And we thought, huh, something's not wrong. I mean, you first you, you look at your spouse and go, wow, he takes after your coordination. They're like, no, 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 something's wrong here. And so we took Michael to the doctor. Michael had, he had his eyes weren't focusing and he had what they call soft, um, soft motor skills. And so we, we took him to, actually to a therapist in the, in the public schools and they, they looked at us and said, oh, he'll never, he was three, he'll never be able to enter kindergarten. He's not, you're going to have to hold him back. You're going to have to hang on to him. He's not going to be able to do it because he can't hold a pencil. He can't, he can't do what he needs to do. But you know, you can hear a report like that and that's negative and that's not good, but aren't you glad we've got a God of hope who gives us hope that we can come out of that. And, and they might have looked at you and said, there's nothing we can do. Well, we've got a God who can still do great things. And we begin to pray. We begin to ask God, Lord, help us. What, what do we need to do? Well, when Michael was three, Michael saw someone play the violin and he wanted to play the violin at three. And we're like, ah, just real hesitant to give a three-year-old a violin. He kept talking about it. So at four, we got him a violin. We rented a little violin. And we found someone to teach him the Suzuki method. And if, you know, a violin is a beautiful, beautiful instrument when it's played well. <laughs> and when it's not played well, it is, it is rough. And, and so Michael began to play and, and he would play it. And boy, when he first learned to play that violin, he is screeching and scratching that thing. And, and it's just, it's, it sounds horrible. And we used to have a little dog that would come and plant right in front of him and just howl every time she played <laughs> But as Michael began to play Joy, one thing about Joy, you may not figure this out about Joy, is when she gets on something, she's like a bulldog. And she's like, I'm going to teach, we're going to get this. And she made him practice and she worked with him. And here's what happened. We didn't realize this, but as he, he looked with his eyes at the frets and as he did the frets and as he did the bow, it strengthened his eyes, it strengthened his hands. And by the time he got in kindergarten, they let him in and he could hold a pencil. Now, he, his handwriting is atrocious. <laughs> but he got through elementary school. He made it all the way through high school. He even went through college and graduated. Hallelujah. <laughs> and, and so, and, and they didn't hold him back. In fact, he's in the ministry now. He works in, in a church in Angleton. But the beautiful thing was, God who gave us hope, a favorable expectation for Michael, also gave us a plan that we could work in that. A plan to cause that hope to come to pass. I call it uh, hope plus. God's got hope for you, but he's also got plus. He's got a plan. There are, there's, a, there's ways to make that happen. That's why we've called this, this series the process of progress. It's not instant. It's a process. And if you'll stay with us during this, you're going to find some ways, hey, I, I can do this. And you know in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, there's a great idea of hope plus. It's an idea of, of God giving a plan. And it's, it starts with, with, with a young man named Joseph. If you're not familiar with Joseph, there were, there's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. He had four different wives, 12 sons, everybody under one roof. And you think your family has challenges. That's a challenge. And the 12 brothers were very competitive. The dad played favorites. Joseph was a favorite. And Joseph was a young man who had God-given dreams. God gave him a dream that he would be a ruler. And actually, one day that his brothers and father and mother would come and, and, and bow down to him. Very clear dreams, very real dreams. And so those dreams held Joseph. Well, Joseph, his brothers, you know what, can you imagine telling a bunch of, 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 of competitive brothers, hey guys, I had a dream. And in my dream, I had a sheaf of wheat and it stood up straight and all your sheaves bowed down to it. What do you think of that? And they're like, oh, that blesses us so much, Joseph. No, they're like, we're going to kill you, man. We're, we're going to kill you. And they actually, instead of killing him, they sold him as a slave. <laughs> Lovely family. And, and, and he was a slave in Egypt. And he's a slave for a while. And then someone lied about him. And he was unjustly committed to prison. So there's Joseph's backstory. But in, while Joseph was in prison, the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, one night he had a dream, and he dreamed that there were 12, I mean, excuse me, seven fat cows 
that were grazing, and seven skinny gaunt cows came up from the river and ate the fat cows. And you couldn't even tell that they were eaten. And he wakes up, and he's like, whew. He goes back to sleep. He has another dream. Seven ears of corn, beautiful ears of corn. But then here comes seven gaunt, blighted ears of corn, and they eat the fat ears, and you can't even tell they were eating them. This time, Pharaoh wakes up in a cold sweat. He, he wakes everybody up. Okay, that's it. Call the, call the magicians in. And they call the magicians in, and he told them what the dream was. Listen, God gave Pharaoh this dream. And if God gives you a dream, he'll give you an answer. Sometimes people get so disturbed by dreams. And they're like, Alan, I had this dream. And in this dream, like I'm wearing a ballerina tutu and I'm running through my high school singing a song. What does that mean? It means you had too much pizza before you went to bed and you need to leave that one alone. When God gives you a dream, he'll give you an answer. So here's Pharaoh. He had this dream and, and, and he asked his magicians, they're like, we don't know. He said, but we hear about a guy in prison named Joseph. He has some experience with dreams. He said, call him. And Joseph came. The thing I love about Joseph is he'd been a slave. He'd been unjustly accused as a prisoner. But Joseph never gave up on God. And I really believe those dreams that God gave Joseph held him steady during the tough times. That even though he was in a difficult situation, he had a dream that he was one day going to be a ruler. And he held on to that. And he still had a good attitude about God. And when he shows up in front of Pharaoh, Pharaoh says, I understand that you can, you can tell dreams. And, and Joseph looked at him and said, no. He said, it's not in me. He said, but God will give you an answer of peace. And Pharaoh tells Joseph the dream. This is what happens. Joseph is speaking. He said, it's just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt. But seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food, of all these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. And this food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? It's interesting that God gave Joseph hope for Pharaoh, but he gave him hope plus because he gave him a plan, gave him a very specific plan. Seven good years are coming and they're going to be followed by seven bad years, but, but God's going to help you in this. Here's the plan. And the plan was very specific. We're going to save 20%. Now we're going to put some aside. We're going to store up a little bit, 20%. For seven years, they stored 20%. It was doable. They were, already, they were already farming and harvesting, so this was right in line with what they were already doing. So it was a doable. It was going to, be, it was going to cost them something, yes, but it was doable. And it was faith. It really had a basis of faith. Pharaoh had to believe this is a dream from God. Pharaoh had to believe that this is God's plan. Because how many of you know that if, if you have years and years and years of good, you start to think, why are we storing up? It's kind of like we are on the Gulf Coast. We don't get the hurricane for years and years and years. We're thinking, hey, let's build something. There's nothing coming. But you get, you get a false sense of security. And I'm sure after about that fifth and sixth year, they're like, why, why are we storing? Things have never been better. And it took faith to stay with God's plan. But God's plan was a good one. Because what God's plan did was Pharaoh chose Joseph to be the guy in charge of the whole country. And it promoted him out of prison. And it got him out of the captivity he'd been in. And what's ironic is, is that about years later, close to, close to eight years later after this, by this time, it's almost 25 years since Joseph has seen his brothers. They show up to buy food because God's plan also sustained the countries around Egypt. And they show up to buy, and they, when they see Joseph, the number two guy, they all bow down and the dream is fulfilled. God has hope, but he's got hope plus. Do you realize that God still has hope for you? You may look at that situation and go, well, 
you know, that's, that's Joseph and I'm not Joseph. No, no, no. Listen, God, God's big enough to have hope for you. Now, look at this verse here in, in Psalms. It says, happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Our hope is not in an economy. It's not in a new relationship. It's not in the new year. Our hope is in God. And God can get hope to you, a, a confident, favorable expectation. Let me give you three ways he does it. Here's the first one. He can, he can put you around people, or you can go around people who believe in God and believe in you. Now, I realize that church, oh, do you realize that January is one of the top attendance months of the year for church? And I'm, well, I'm happy about that. And I, what happens is people, you know what happens? People are like, we need to get back to church. Or we need to get in church. Because they believe that, that going to church would actually help them and actually be a blessing to them. You say, Alan, why are you always talking about going to church? You just want people to come and hear your sermons. Yes. <laughs> but there's more to it than that. There's a book I've been reading. I'm going to recommend. I really recommend books, but here's the good book. It's a secular book. It's outstanding. It's called Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits by James Clear. You can get it on Amazon. And it is, it's an outstanding book. And here's what, he's done a lot of background in what changes people's behavior. And here's what they found changed. A lot of times we go to church and we're not just going to church to hear sermons. Maybe we go and connect or we get in a class or we get involved and we get around people who love God. People who have godly homes. People who believe God can do great things. And that's exciting. Because they found is who you hang out with influences your behavior. They've done studies. They've done hundreds of them. Do you know they, they found out that if you want to get in shape this year and you want to get fit, you need to hang out with people who are in shape and fit. And it will dramatically impact your ability to do that. Conversely, if you hang out with people who are like, no, let's see how much weight we can gain this year. It, <laughs> it will impact you negatively. And they found that you want to be around the people who have behaviors that you want to emulate. Will being in church help you? Yes. Will it help your family? Yes. Can it strengthen your marriage? Yes. And you can get around people and maybe you come to church one Sunday and it's been a rough week and you're like, man, I don't know. I, 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 I guess I, I need to pray. And instead of people stepping back going, pray? Why would you pray? You're going to lock hands with someone and go, yes, let's pray. Because God can do big things and big things can happen and we need that. I always like... I've always liked going to church because I look around and go, okay, I'm not crazy. There are people who believe God. There are people who are trusting God. And I want these kind of people in my life because they're on a better trajectory than I'm on. And it can help change me. People in your life can help you. God can still give you dreams. That's another way he brings hope. Not just, not just the tutu dreams, but, but real dreams. Or he can give you very real dreams or he can put something in your heart. Or you just have a vision to build a company, to have a family that's strong, to do, have something in ministry, to do something different. And it's different from where you are. And you say, man, God just put that in me. And then here's the, here's the most effective way you can do it, by his word and by his spirit. God's word is like planting seeds of hope in your life. And his Holy Spirit, Jesus said, his Holy Spirit, who lives in you, by the way, can show you things to come. Joy was at a Christmas Eve 25 years ago. She was at a Christmas Eve service, but this is before we started the ark. She was with her father, and when they turned to light the candles, the Holy Spirit spoke to Joy's heart, a scripture, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. And it, it shocked her, because in a moment she knew, he can show you things to come. In a moment she knew her dad was going to die. Now it shocked her because, one, her dad had stiff-armed Christianity. But two, we didn't know he was sick. A month later, they they came and sat in our kitchen and told us that he'd been diagnosed with cancer and had a year to live. When he got up from the table, Joy's mom looked at us and shook her head. She said, he doesn't have a year. He has much less than that. He got progressively worse. Joy was sick at the very same time. But Joy had hope. She had a promise. The Holy Spirit had shown her something. So one day she said it was a miracle. She said the whole house just got quiet. You know, it's just me and my dad sitting there on the, on the couch. She said and, my dad was laying down. I said, Dad, you need to pray with me. You need to make Jesus the Lord of your life. And he gave her the standard answer. Joy, you pray for me. You pray for me. And Joy got bold. She can get bold at times. Trust me. <laughs> I have seen. She got bold. She said, Dad, 
you need to pray this prayer. And I've never, and she said, I'll never forget what he said. He said, okay, just this once. <laughs> Listen, guys, once is all you need. And, and Joy led him, and he prayed the prayer and confessed Jesus as the Lord and Savior of his life. Three weeks later, he's gone. And the priest that came into the home and administered last rites said, I've never seen a man more peaceful facing death. Why was he peaceful? He prayed one simple prayer, but that was a prayer that connected him with the Lord. And now he had hope for his future. And God can still give you hope. He can give you hope, but he can also give you a plan. He's still the master planner. Real quick things about plans. When God gives you a plan, plans are, need to be specific. Now, oftentimes, we, we make goals, and I love making goals. I think it's good to have goals. Our goal is, I want to be a better Christian. Uh, maybe your goal is, I want to go to church more this year. Instead of doing that, become more specific. In fact, there's something, again, from the book that says that there's a principle called the implementation intention. Big words, implementation intention. And it says, if you would simply write out exactly what you want to do and when you want to do it, he said, your chances of fulfilling that are stronger. So instead of saying, hey, I want to go to church more this year, you write down, say on Thursday, we are going to church at 1130 Sunday at the ark. Boom, you write that, you write that out. You say, well, why, why would you do that? To keep you from waking up on Sunday morning and trying to figure it out. Because when you wake up on Sunday morning, all hell can bust loose on Sunday morning. The kids are all acting crazy. The dog throws up in the living room. You can't get the television to work. You can't find your socks. And then you start looking at one another going, do you want to go? I don't know. Do you want to go? I don't know. What do you think? Do you want to go? I don't know. How do you feel? Do you want to go? And you go back. Did you like last week? No, I didn't like last week. I didn't think it was that good. Well, you think it'll be any better this week? I don't know if it's going to be any better. Are you want to go? No, let's don't go. And then you're out. But if you already got it written down, you're going to go, nope, we're going. Get in the car. Everybody pile in. And man, you're throwing kids and clothes and everything in the car. And you make it part of your lifestyle because you know it's going to work. It's going to help you. Just say, Alan, why are you telling this? Because I, 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 I know what church will do for you. I know what reading your Bible would do for you. I, I, I know this. But make it specific. Don't, and then make it doable. If you're like, okay, I'm going to read Project 345 in a month, the whole New Testament. Time. That's going to be tough. Start with one chapter a day. Or maybe you just need to take a verse. I challenged our staff in 2018. I said, find five verses that pertain to different areas of your life. Maybe it's healing. Maybe finances. Maybe you need wisdom. Maybe you need strength. Just fear. I said, find five verses. Memorize those verses. Speak those verses. So I gave them an assignment, find five. They had to turn them in to me. But I, I, didn't, I didn't do five. It's 2018, I did 18. I got cute with this. I'm going to do 18. And you know what happened is I didn't fulfill it because it wasn't doable. The time just, it, it got too much. And so pick a, pick a scripture. Maybe it's one scripture. Maybe it's the, it's the Lord's Prayer. Maybe it's the 23rd Psalm. Maybe it's uh, uh, one I like is uh, second. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, take one scripture and say, you know what? I'm, I'm going to give this scripture the RS, RSVP treatment. RSVP. Read slowly. Read the scripture slowly. Don't just speed read it. Read it slowly. V is voice it. Speak it out loud so you can hear yourself. P is personalize it. Make it for you. So you might take that verse, you're going to read it slowly. For God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. You read it out loud, and then you begin to personalize that. Lord, I want to thank you that you have not given me a spirit of fear, but you've given me a spirit of power. Not weak, not a weak spirit, a powerful spirit, and a spirit of love, and a spirit of a sharp, sound mind. Make it doable. You can do that. You can find one. You can find, find a few if you like. But start with something that's doable for you and then do something that's faith-based. You know, it, you're, gonna, you're gonna have to mix faith with it. You're gonna have to mix faith. I promise you, you start coming regularly, you'll come on a Sunday and you'll walk out and you go, eh. you know, Alan, eh. he's been better. Bless his heart. <laughs> or maybe it just didn't speak to you or maybe it just didn't click with you. And if you're, not, if you're not careful, that's when you start to, to fade away. 
But if you believe, no, no, God's putting good things in me. This is helping me. This is helping my family. And you're going to have to stay with it. Don't come up to me going, Alan, I have come for three weeks in a row, three Sundays in a row, and my family is still messed up. I want to go, Sparky, I need you to stay with me for just a little longer than three weeks. But if you'll stay with it, if you'll stay with it, if you'll stay with it, the best things in life you've got to stay with. And if you'll stay with them, they're going to produce some good results. Because here's the deal. God's got good things for you. He's got good things for you this year. Now, you might be hearing this today and you're thinking, I don't know, Alan. I mean, that's all great and good, but I'm just back in church. or I'm, I'm in church. I mean, I am, I am not a good Christian. I have not, I mean, 2018 was not my best year. Would God have good plans for me? When I was in college, about to graduate from college, I, I, I can look on years of not living for God. I got up one morning and the Lord spoke to my heart. I'd never forget, I wrote it down. I've never forgotten it. It's, it. It just came from him. Say, God will do anything he can to reach you. And I wrote down, I got plans for your life when you decide to live them. I've got riches and wisdom and I'm waiting to give them. When you yield to my will and let me determine what's best, then your life will abound with love, joy, and rest. Love God. I remember writing that down. I just wrote the words just flowed. I didn't wordsmith it. I just wrote it. And after I wrote it, I went, whoa. I went out to my room and I went, Reggie, listen to this. And I read him that. And he looked at me and said, are you smoking? I said, no, I'm not smoking anything. I just, I just, this, 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 is, this is what? This is God trying to, what's he trying to do? He's got plans for me. A month later, a month later, excuse me, I'm sorry. It was a little bit, that's right before I graduated. That was May. In, in October, I met Joy. And I, I prayed one prayer. Lord, here's my life. And that was 37 years ago. And God changed things. He had plans for me, yeah. Is my life abounded with love, joy, and rest? Love, joy, and rest. <laughs> yes, yes. But, but, but listen to me. So many times people say, well, yeah, that's you and that's me, but I, I got a different situation. Paul wrote Timothy this, and this is what he said. He said, meditate on these things. He'd given him some things to do. He said, give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. God wants you to make progress. He wants you to make progress this year, past the discouragement, past the failures, past the barriers, past the things that have held you captive. He wants you promoted out of prison. And he wants you in a place that's good because when you make progress, it not only blesses you, it blesses people around you. You see, today if you leave and you get out and you, you go to your vehicle and you get in your vehicle and you put your foot firmly on the brake, two things I can promise you are going to happen. You've got your foot on the brake. Two things, you're not going to wreck. And you're not going to go anywhere. Your foot is, we're going to drive past you. They're they're closing up the whole parking lot. You're sitting there with your foot on the brake. And you say, I want to make progress. I want to make progress. Okay. Well, if you're going to make progress, you're going to have to take your foot off the brake and you're going to have to put it on the accelerator and you're going to have to, we're going to have to put, push that accelerator down. And is it risky? Yes. But is it going to help you? Yes. Because the God who has hope has a plan for you, and that maybe you, you've had the break on. So many people got the break on their life, and they're like, I've had disappointments, Alan, and I've had things that have not gone right, and I've tried, and I've messed up, and I have New Year's resolutions from years back that I never have kept. Does God still have a good plan for me? Yes, he's still the God of hope, but he needs you to take your foot off the brake and put it over the accelerator and say, I'm going to buy into God's process, and I'm going to get out of this situation. I am moving past this, and not only will it bless me, it'll bless my family, it'll bless all the people around me because he is a God of hope. I believe this is going to be a great year for us. A great year as a church. You say, Alan, you say that every year. Why do you say that every year? Because I believe it every year because we've got a God of hope who has good things in store and we've got a lot of work to do in this area and it's going to be an outstanding year. Let's take our foot off the brake. Let's put the pedal to the metal. Let's buy into the process. Let's have a great year. Will you bow your heads with me as we pray?